Hi, I'm Jonathan Capehart of The Washington Post and MSNBC's The Sunday Show. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this 92nd Street Y Confronts Hate event, the History Channel's Tulsa Burning, the 1921 Race Massacre, conversation with directors Stanley Nelson and Marco Williams, and Tulsa descendant Brenda Nails Alford. So I, you, I'm going to throw. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I want to throw this first question out to all of you. Um, I'm going to save Ms. Alford for last. So I'll start with you. Start with you, Marco, and we'll go go that way. The importance of having the conversation about the race massacre in Tulsa, 1921, a hundred years later, 2021. How important is it for us to not only talk about Tulsa, but to really learn and know about what happened on that day, a hundred years ago on June 1st? That's a lot to consider and ponder. Um, look, the simple answer is that those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. And this is a very significant part of our history as a nation, both because of the atrocity that took place 100 years ago, this coming May 30th, May 31st, June 1st, but also to know about the history that preceded it, the uh, African-American excellence. Uh, why is it important to talk about it, to reflect on it? Well, there's so much unresolved in our nation about race, about race relations. Um, so to have this chance to reflect, to consider, and then hopefully to engage and discuss allows us optimistically to move forward with some potential mm -hmm. for reconciliation. Mr. Nelson, your view. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a very important time in our country. I, I think that, you know, over the last year, we've hopefully done a lot of uh, reflecting on, on the past, you know, with the murder of George Floyd and so many other things. So I think it, it, it's a time where at least some people in this country um, of all races are open to looking at, at, at our history, at, however painful it is. And so I think that, uh, you know, Tulsa is, is one of the, the foundation in some ways stories of this country, you know, and, and, and it says so much about where we were and it says so much about where we are now. And Ms. Alford, as, as a descendant, what does it mean to you in this moment to be talking about what happened in your hometown to your relatives, to your relatives, family, and, and friends. Uh, what does it say? What does this moment mean to you right now? This is an um, awesome time in history as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is something that I don't believe that my grandparents and our community members could have ever imagined uh, could have happened. Uh, it was swept under the rugs for so many years. Uh, our community members, our families didn't really talk about it uh, for various reasons. Uh, um, they were somewhat threatened with their very lives if they even mentioned it. So I think that we're here in this day and time discussing this tragic event and basically educating our community members, our children on what happened. And by doing so, we're showing the strength, courage, and tenacity of our families and community members. And we want them to have pride in uh, our community members because they showed so much. And it teaches us as a whole that when we face adversities in our own lives to never give up, to keep the faith and to keep moving forward. And so let's talk about what happened. Um, the, the, your, your film is, um, you know, Mr. Williams and Mr. Nelson, is really terrific. You do it in a series of acts. I think you go up to act nine, act 10, I believe, and you're telling the story, 10, and you're telling the story um, really in the way that Ms. Alford was just talking about, you know, from the beginning of what it was like in Tulsa and then what drove, what were the events that drove things to happen uh, in late May, early June of 1921. 
Um, talk about, um, I'll have you go first, Mr. Mr. Nelson, um, why you decided to tell the story of Tulsa in that way. Um, well, I, I think that, that um, one of the big decisions for us in making the film was to, to tell the story of, of 1921, but also the story of, of 1920, of the search for, for bodies and, and to, to try to figure out a way to go back and forth in time. And that was uh, a really uh, a foundation for, for the film. You know, it's really important that we tell both stories because both stories are packed with um, tension, you know, and and uh, we wanted to show not only what, what happened a hundred years ago, but what was happening now. So I think that was one of the key decisions in making the film. And uh, Mr. Williams? Yeah, to just uh, build off of what uh, Stanley has uh, shared, the in, in attempting, and I think we did succeed in showing what happened in 1921, 1920, prior to it, and what is going on today, it really is a way to, to acknowledge that the past does inform the present and that the present in terms of its effort to be reconciled is in many ways reflecting upon to reconcile the past. So they're intertwined, mm -hmm. but equally the search for mass graves as one of the activists says, uh, Christy Williams at the end when, when coffins have been found, it, it's sort of the proof. There's no, even though there are the photographs, even though there are the oral histories by descendants, this is sort of the real evidence, it's sort of inex, in, inex, inescapable that atrocities were committed. If you don't want to believe the photographs, despite how astonishing they are. So I think that that's really the, 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 the ebb and flow, the give and take between past and present. You, you know, in the, um, in the film, you do a terrific job of setting up, how is it that Black people got to, to Oklahoma in the first place? Why they went there? What drove them there? And then like, what were the seeds of, of their success? One of them being oddly, because of segregation and not being able to you know, do business, conduct business it, with whites, Black Wall Street and, that, and the Greenwood section and that part of Tulsa just became this economic powerhouse as you, you do a great job of laying out and talking about how that came to be, how those people got there, how they were able to build their businesses and how they were able to be successful. And Ms. Alford, I'm coming to you on this um, because I want you to talk about your, I believe it's your great grandfather, my grandfather. Your grandfather. And grandmother and my great uncle. T talk about them because I believe it's the, the it was the Nails, bro Nail, Nails Brothers shoe shop and record shop. Yes, it was. Talk uh, about them. The Nails family uh, basically came from uh, Texas by covered wagon shortly before statehood uh, because of a promise that many had heard that there was a better life in Oklahoma and that there was an opportunity for you to be successful and to raise your families. And so uh, many people, just like my family, uh, they migrated to Tulsa for a better life, if you will. Uh, my grandparents, uh, James and Bastanor Nails Sr., along with my great uncle, were the proud owners of the Nails Brothers Shoe Shop and Record Shop that was located at 121 North Greenwood Avenue. They were also the first owners of what is now Lacey Park, wherein the Nails Dance Pavilion and Skating Rink was located. They also operated a limousine and taxi service. So they were very entrepreneurial minded people as many were at that time. They were proud of what they were doing. My, my grandfather was a very proud college educated shoemaker, if you will, from Prairie View AMM. And uh, he basically worked hard along with my great uncle, our family members to start our businesses, to be successful. They were able to employ family members and community members and uh, to lose all that in a matter of hours is uh, devastating. Okay, so let's talk about what happened that led to that moment where 
the Nails Brothers uh, shoe shop and, and record shop obliterated, uh, what is it, 40, 40 square blocks obliterated. Um, uh, Mr. Williams, what was the precipitating event? What set things off? What sets things off, the precipitating event, the most explicit was the belief that a young African-American male assaulted a young white woman. And as we know, if we know our history, that has been the, the dog whistle, as one of the scholars says in the, in the film, a dog whistle for a lynching. But what we really know, what I think the film also highlights is that at its core, the precipitating event was resentment and jealousy of the success of the Black community. As, as Brenda has shared, and I, you know, the, just listening to Brenda speak about the, the pride and honor of the, the remarkable achievement. But yes, an allegation of a, of a Black man assaulting a white woman gave white men in particular the the permission in their mind to form a lynch mob and yet proud successful african-american men many of whom were world war one veterans went and confronted and challenged this notion that they were going to lynch this uh, young man and that became combustible but as i said and stanley was very astute in this that resentment and jealousy was really the, the wick of the, or the fuse that ignited Tulsa. You know, it, I'm sorry, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark. Yeah. And that was the, the way you, the two of you showed that, um, the sort of the ping ponging back and forth of, of the tension of what was going on, the, the idea that black men would show up with guns to protect this, to protect this guy and the whites being really angry and leaving and coming back with with their own guns and even more people. Um, Mr. Nelson, the, the, the siege, um, before the siege, as they're doing all this back and forth, we're showing up with our guns. Then it seemed like for a little while there, things had calmed down for a little while. But what what did White Tulsa do in those hours when things seemed calm? I, I mean, I, I I believe that that White Tulsa kind of got got themselves together and got themselves organized and really went at 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 Black Tulsa in force. Um, people came from surrounding towns and and and, and you know it was just um, a, a planned massacre. Uh, again, you know, it, it, it had nothing to do with this young boy, you know, who, who whatever he, he did, um, I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't even accused of, 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 of rape, you know, it was like he bumped into her on an elevator or something, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, it, it, it's so blatant because in no way would that um, uh, justify any of this, but, you know, um, it, it the the town was burnt down you know it was it was systematic and and, and it was um um you know very organized and 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 it was about as marco said you know about jealousy and so many times that was what happened to african-american communities that that um white folks were jealous of their success. One of the things about, about Greenwood that, that's so amazing is that, you know, because there were so many stores and so many businesses that the dollars would stay in Greenwood. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the economic tests, you know, like how, how does the dollar spin? Does it have to go out of the community? Um, and how long will it stay? But the dollar stayed in the community of Greenwood because Greenwood was almost self-contained. And, and I believe that, that that was just too much for white folks, you know, that that, that was just too much. And, um, you know, they needed an excuse and the excuse um, happened and, and um, you know, the massacre was the result. And to fill in some of the some of the blanks there in the story, if I remember right from the film, um, that young that young boy was working, I believe, um, at a shoe shine 
at a place where they wouldn't allow, there was no bathroom for him to use, but the owner of that shop made arrangements for him to be able to use the quote unquote colored bathroom on the fourth floor of another building down the street. And in order to get to that fourth floor, he had to ride the elevator. And it was a, a white girl who was serving as elevator operator. As you point out in the film, something happened that jolted, to, jolted the elevator, causing that black boy to bump into um, the white girl. The door opens, she, she screams, he runs out. And you know, you make a point of saying he runs out. And I remember thinking, yeah, yeah I would have run too. Uh, at that time, because I know what's what could befall me, um, given the time that that's in, and that's that's the triggering the triggering thing. Now, you also point out in the movie that the um, the African American community had its guns and they pulled back to the railroad tracks as a way of protecting Greenwood, and then in to your, um, I think it was you, Mr. Williams, or, or I'm re not remembering who, who said it, maybe it was Mr. Nelson, about how, you know, they bided their time, and they bided their time by waiting until sunrise. They lined up around the tracks, you say in the film, that they surrounded Greenwood. And then the moment the sun went up is when all hell broke loose. M M Ms. Alford, I'm wondering, because um, I saw another thing, uh, uh, sort of another video that you did recently, Ms. Alford, where you were talking about how when you were younger, you would hear, you would hear the grown folks talk uh, about things. And I'm wondering in, in, all of the, in all of the talk, in the storytelling that you've heard over, the, uh, over those years when you were growing up, do you remember any snippets of your grandparents or any other relatives talking about what happened in those early hours or even during the siege itself? It wasn't very much. Um, as I've shared, the only things that I could remember uh, was the fact that I always knew that my grandmother had to hide in a church for some reason. And I didn't know why that was. And I was so young, I didn't know the questions to ask. And when we would go to locations, especially when we would have uh, some of our family members come back to town and we would pass by the Oak Lawn Cemetery, the comment would always be made, you know, they're still over there. And everybody in the car would agree, yes, they're still over there. And as I've said, I had a little thing about that cemetery growing up as a little girl because I always wondered what's over there. <laughs> uh, but at that time, I, I certainly did not know. And to learned so many years later what those conversations meant is uh, is unbelievable it's just it's heartbreaking well this is one of those things where they didn't want to well, clearly you were a young a young girl they didn't want to fill your head with horror also they had their own trauma that they had to deal with um mr williams i'll, I'll come to you and to, to have you talk more more fully about what happened, what lay in wait. And both of you, Ms. Williams and Mr. Nelson, talk about what happened in those, those hours. I think people understand that um, white Tulsa unleashed hell on, on black Tulsa with, with guns, but what else did they do in those, in, during those days? Uh, it's plain and simple. It was a massacre. Uh, so torches, machine guns, airplanes, uh, breaking into homes, particularly after people fled, catching people, killing them at point blank. I mean, there, there are stories that uh, I learned in making the film that are not included in the film. A, a elderly couple saying their, their evening prayers and white people killing them right on the spot. Uh, it, 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 it's, it sort of was like a blood thirst, a blood lust. Uh, and as Stanley said, they organized, people came from other parts of, of, of Oklahoma and, and they simply sought to destroy the community. And, and what's important to appreciate 
again, a movie can only present but so much. There were a lot of killings of African Americans before right. the massacre itself took place. So there was the opportunity right. for, you know, all right, we killed some, let's quiet things down. But in fact, the reason why nothing was abated right at the beginning of it was the police department didn't do anything except deputize white men, break into pawn shops and provide guns and ammunition. So you can see that there was a great intent to destroy the community and to murder people. I mean, Mr. Nelson, that blew, that blew my mind when, um, when that came up in the film, that not only did the police department not do anything to protect that young boy or to protect uh, African-Americans, but deputized the, the gangs of people gave them guns and then participated in the massacre. The other thing, which I'm sure a lot of people know by now, um, is that there was an aerial assault as well. Yeah, yeah, and one, one of the few times in the history of this country that uh, people have been bombed, you know, um, and, and uh, so it was in 1921. And I think one of the things that, that's most heartbreaking about it and, and um, so extraordinary about the film is that the Greenwood filmed itself before, you know, so so you see people, the pride in the black people, you see black people, you know, walk, walking out of their house kind of on film, nodding to the camera and then going, sitting on their porch and swinging and, you know, with their head high, and, you know, and, 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 and you see that the pride that, that, that this place had. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that, that I think, um, is so wonderful about the film because it's not just a film about the destruction. It's mm -hmm. also a film about the building and, 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 you know, um, uh, people that that sought a, a new life a different life you know um one of the, the sayings in the united states is go west young man right and what we don't think about black people we you know we in our mind we don't think about african americans but who better to go west right who 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 is going to try to seek out a new land and a new territory and and and, and the promised land but african americans and they sought it out in oklahoma and in in many ways they found it in, in Greenwood. You know, I'm, I'm, um, if you see me looking over, I'm, I'm looking at my extensive notes that I took while, while watching the film. And I was looking for the, the notation here that an estimated between 100 and 300 people were killed, 1,200, 1,250 homes destroyed. Um, and then there were the and then there is the the mass graves and Miss Alford, you mentioned this earlier about when you were when you drove by what was it o Oakland Cemetery, and you would hear them say they're they're all you know they're still over there, and um, in the film what you do in terms of the back and forth present day versus um, those actual videos from Greenwood is that you show the story of uh, an excavation crew yes. going to the cemetery to see if indeed they are still there. Uh, and Ms. Alford, you're, you're a, a, a big part of that. Uh, how, how important do you think it was, <clears throat> excuse me, not just to you personally, but to Tulsa to actually no longer have Oaklawn Cemetery be shrouded in mystery, but be a known place where people there, I'm not, I don't even want to call it a last resting place, but where, where they were left after being massacred. You know, this whole process uh, is just so significant in and of itself because it basically shows that the history was correct, that the stories that were told and shared all through the years were actually correct. Um, and it gives uh, our community a sense of solace and justice to some extent to find these graves, to verify that they are in fact uh, victims of the race massacre and to bring some sense of peace 
and justice to our community, as I've said. Uh, community, uh, my family members of mine, you know, talked about how as they ran for their lives, they lost friends, neighbors that they never saw again. Uh, the community members were not able to memorialize their families and their friends and their uh, neighbors in, a, in the way that they should have been. So we're hoping that this will bring some sense of uh, the community being able to uh, right that wrong that was done. Um, I know how it feels to have someone buried somewhere and not know where they are. I mean, my great grandmother was buried there in 1925 after she uh, passed away. She was a survivor. And, you know, to be able to maybe uh, find maybe some family members and basically, you know, connect them with the DNA and all uh, mm -hmm. whatever we can do to bring some sense of justice in such a terrible situation, that is what we want to do because it is way overdue and the community deserves it. And what you what's depicted in the film is um, a partial excavation. Yes. But am I right uh, in understanding that uh, on June 1st, 2021, a full excavation is going to be done? Yes, we will continue with the excavations. Uh, and then uh, there will be, and this is a long, tedious process, if you will, uh, because we don't want to disturb the uh, coffins anymore, you know, uh, because the, um, this is almost 100 years and they are very mm -hmm. delicate. And we want to preserve as much as of that uh, information that we can to basically make the identifications to the best uh, um, to the best uh, situations that we can. Uh, we definitely want to do that. So um, it's very, mm -hmm. like I said, a very tedious uh, process. Sure, and in fact, you you show Miss Williams in the film, you know, just how careful they are in not only digging into the earth, but then in when they come across uh, human remains, how, um, how delicate they are. And there's one moment in, in the film that I actually found uh, quite uh, moving. And that was when the crew apparently found remains. And it seems like they're all standing in a circle. It's, it's shot from a distance. And you can see them bowing their heads and one of them does the, si the sign of the cross. What was that like to capture that on film, to know that, you know, you're making a movie and they are uncovering history before your very eyes? Um, well, the, 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 when, when the first evidence of a mass grave was indicated in the press conference. I, I can remember, you know, grabbing hold of my chair and, and lowering myself down. I was so overcome with emotion and, and, and sorrow uh, and that, you know, basically brought tears to my eyes. And I, I would say that Brenda says it best. Uh, which is in the film that, you know, we held hands, uh, you know, it, it was an emotional moment and further though, it was affirming. And I think that that's the feeling that I had is that the, the tension between being really distraught by the fact that we, there are, there are bodies, nobody can deny that they were dumped in mass graves and also then the hope that it would signify some movement towards repair um, restitution um, and ultimately honoring those folks who never had a home going mm -hmm. mr nelson and am i wrong to think or maybe you know maybe i'm I, Maybe I'm a little twisted, but when I hear mass grave, I don't think of coffins. You know, I have the, the image from World War II when the, the concentration camps were liberated and what they did to those who didn't survive. And just, you know, that to me was a mass grave. Did it, did it surprise you that the that those killed in the massacre 
were given the modicum of respect of being put in a coffin. Well, I mean, I, I think the whole thing was was surprising for us in a way. I mean, we knew going in that they were excavating. We knew that they that they were looking for bodies. We did not know what they were go going to find mm -hmm. or if they were going to, going to find anything. We don't know. I think at this point, um, you know, if 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 more bodies are found and and how they will be buried. Um, so some people were buried in coffins. We know that. We don't mm -hmm. know the rest. I mean, I think one of the things that um, that, that you have to understand is is this whole the whole massacre was covered up. The the white paper in in Tulsa wouldn't even publish any stories about it. So so. It's not only that 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 people didn't want to talk about it. It's that it's that the 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 city and the state set out to erase it. So we don't know, um, you know, how how people were buried, and 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 hopefully we'll find out uh, uh, more and more information. And you know that gets go ahead, Marco. Sorry, Ms. Williams. You know, Stanley, you know, really hones in on what's really important. You noted that. The estimates are between 100 and 300 killed, and there are stories of, of, of massacre uh, victims being thrown in the river. Uh, this just happens to be one location where there was some uh, evidence that there might be uh, mass graves or massacre victims, and that was that there was a you know there was a funeral home that did put them in pine coffins. And, and it's a very brief moment in the film that, you know, I wish people, well, I hope that people will note and maybe they'll note subliminally, but it's at the very end of when the massacre is, is told, it's a very, very wide shot. And in the, in the bottom of the frame are uh, wagons drawn by mule or work horses. And you can see coffins. And at that point, where were they going to be buried? Since mm -hmm. all the African Americans were rounded up and put in concentration camps, they just dumped them in a place because there was no regard for our humanity as African Americans. And you know, you that was another good, I'm glad you brought that up about the concentration camps, because an, another thing that I learned in the film and that might surprise a lot of people is one, there were concentration camps, but two, that in order to get out of the concentration camp, the Black Tulsan had to have a white person vouch for them in order for them to get out. Ms. Alford, did you, I mean, I know your relatives didn't say much about what happened, but when did you learn about that aspect of the, the race massacre? Um, as I began to do my research shortly after I found about out, out uh, after I found out about that uh, aspect of our family history. Uh, and then I would read an account uh, or an interview that was done by my great grandmother with uh, Mrs. Mary Parrish, who would write some of the, you know, the first accounts of the race massacre in her book entitled Events of the Tulsa Disaster. And she, one of the little uh, snippets that she has in there is that, you know, she says, old and young were piled on the trucks. And as we were being driven through town, men could be seen clapping their hands, rejoicing at our condition. Mm. Now she's being driven through town on her way to an inter internment camp. I mean, talk yeah. about taking away a community's dignity. I mean, their dignity, their livelihood, their, livelihood. their family, yes. everything. Um, I, I, just, just, I just want to yeah. you know, amplify this because absolutely right. So Stanley pointed out that really Tulsa is the first instance where Americans were bombed by Americans, yeah. right? First instance where airplanes dropped bombs on this soil. So we know Pearl Harbor, we know 9-11, but very few people realize that Americans were bombing Americans in 1921. Further, 
the whole idea of concentration camps, right? We, we usually simply think about that with Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Maybe we think about that with the Kilmer Rouge, but we don't think about that with Americans. And the fact that they had to wear not a star of David, but basically a ribbon that gave permission. But what should be really pointed out is that for the most part, those who were given permission to leave worked in the white community. They were more likely than not to be the working class people who might have worked in the white community. It may have been Dick Rowland, if you will, shining shoes, because all of the businesses in Greenwood were destroyed and all of those businesses were black owned. So there was no white person giving you permission to do what exactly? Mm. Where were you going to go? At best, you were going to go to discover that your home or business had been destroyed and that there was nothing left. You know, the, the, the pictures, you know, tell, tell, tell the story mm -hmm. of, of, the, of a massacre. Can I get you to talk more, Mr. Nelson, about the silence? How it's possible that an entire section of a city can be burned to the ground its citizens murdered, driven out of town, and not only do the newspapers not talk about it, but white Tulsa doesn't talk about it. Um, and black Tulsa is too traumatized to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, um, white Tul uh, black Tulsa in a way might have talked about it in some ways to themselves. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, uh, there, there are people in the film who talk about it. Um, uh, some interviews that were that, that were done a, a few years back, who had actual you know descendants of uh, people who are very very young, um, are, are still able to talk about it. But at, at this point, you know, uh, the community's destroyed. I mean, who are you going to talk about it to? You know, it's there's not you know they, 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 there's nothing left of, of the community. So so and and I, I think one of the things, and, and I'm not sure if this happened, you know, in 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 Tulsa, but I think that you know um, African Americans, in a way, you know, we haven't we haven't talked about enslavement, right? We don't we you know the generation that that got out of slavery, we did not talk about it. We did not build museums about it. You know, um, um, I think that 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 so many, so much of, so many times we want to kind of forget it and move on. You know, um, and 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 we just we fail to kind of talk about these really traumatic experiences that 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 um, that are part part of our history. Ho hopefully, that that will change because we have to talk about these things. Ms. Alford, in all the things that you've you have learned since you you've grown up and uh, and now the the grown folks talk to you now that you are grown folk, what was the was there one thing that you learned about what happened during the race massacre that just took your breath away in the sense that you had no idea how how horrible people could be to each other, or maybe how gracious people can be to each other. I'm just, I'm wondering if, if you've learned anything new or revelatory as a result of your, your own discovery about what happened in your hometown. Well, I know that uh, my family members, uh, along with their neighbors and friends, they ran for their lives to uh, one of the area parks. Uh, Golden Gate Park. And then uh, there were so many people out in that area, as my understanding, they had to run further east towards what is now the present day Mohawk Park. And that that was part of ways away from the Greenwood District. Mm. Um, my grandparents, a little girl, their, their only child at that time was two years old. Okay. My grandmother was uh, expecting their second child, their first son. Okay. So, I mean, it was very traumatic. She could have lost him just like many women did. Uh, but, you know, they persevered. I mean, in spite of what they endured, uh, that little two-year-old girl would grow up to be a wonderful young lady and uh, graduate magna cum laude from Langston University, uh, be a Fulbright scholar, uh, be a very well-known educator in the, the schools that she grew up in. 
And uh, she would go on to teach in those very schools, as I said. And, you know, I like to tell those stories because it shows the strength of the community that in spite of what we endure, we basically aspire to maintain and to move forward. And that is what, you know, brings me joy. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I talk about the horrible aspect of it, the heartbreaking aspect of it, but at the same time, I like to show the strength and the tenacity of our family and community members. Mr. Williams, what did you, what did you learn in the process of, of making this film that you perhaps didn't know before? Um, Brenda mentioned one aspect of it, uh, and I really feel it's important for people to appreciate that there were three women, African-American women, who really brought this narrative to life and to make sure that nobody forgot it. It was Mary E. Parrish, uh, it was Ruth uh, Sigler Avery, I believe, and um, Eddie Faye Gates. Uh, Eddie Faye Gates did uh, oral histories, as you see in the film. Mary Parrish collected oral histories uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of, of the massacre. And so I'm profoundly grateful that there were these tenacious, determined women who sought out the survivors of the massacre whether they were those who lived immediately in the, in the aftermath of it, or those who were children who who's stayed in Tulsa, who, who collected those narratives. It's in some ways like having a slave narratives mm -hmm. in the sense that these are first person accounts. And so that was one of the great uh, uh, discoveries for me was the fact that there was a record of survivors who could tell and narrate what actually occurred. What about you, Mr. Nelson? I mean, can I say something? Uh, sure, sure. On what uh, Mr. Wayne, excuse me, Mr. Nelson. Uh, but uh, to Marco's point, you know, those three women did an absolutely wonderful job in telling our story. I think it's just phenomenal that my great grandmother spoke with Mrs. Parrish, and my aunt, the late Dr. Cecilia Nels Palmer, spoke with Ruth Stigler Avery, did an interview with her. Uh, and here I am, another generation, a third generation telling the story and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Thank you both, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Williams. You're very welcome, Brenda. Thank you for your participation, your eloquence uh, and your sharing of the story and your position on the uh, Race Massacre Commission and the dignity you brought to that commission as well. Thank you. You were gonna jump in there, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I learned so much about the, the founding of, of, of Greenwood and that, you know, that the move west, that there were uh, about 100 African American communities in the West, you know, um, that that this was that that this was something that was done, that um, African Americans were, were, were trying to make Oklahoma kind of like a black state. You know um, that 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 really the, the 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 move to live somewhere in peace and dignity um, was not just this you know uh, singular uh, piece of Greenwood, but that it was something that that African Americans you know really really did and, and sought out, and um, in some ways we continue to do that. You know what? It just it just hit me. Um... Earlier on, you mentioned how um, the, that the, the, the film clips that we see of, of Black people in Tulsa, that that was them, that was during the time. Where did you find, where did you find this material? Um, I'll let Marco an answer it, but you know, all we, we I mean, <laughs> that was what, you know, we just pushed for that for that from the from the moment we started making the film. I knew that some some things existed, but we just you know um, from day one, you know, we just kind of kind of look all all over. We try to just first find things to, to tell the story, and and I think that that one of the things that happens for Greenwood is is that they were so proud of their community that they took pictures they even made movies you know of it and and uh, it 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 makes it so that 
um, you can really tell the story. You know, we just don't, we're not just talking about it. You can see it. Mm -hmm. You can see what, what, what Greenwood was. And, and also there were pictures taken about uh, um, of the destruction of Greenwood. You know, um, so that 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 also there's amazing pictures and footage of 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 the, this the city after it's destroyed. Uh, I, I can't remember the specifics, but I will say that one of the one of the things that I have actually learned from uh, Stanley is the 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 importance, the opportunity, and the necessity to begin looking for archival material from the very beginning that you start making the film. You don't wait until the film is done to then look for images or footage that illustrates what, what you've got somebody discussing. You look for it early on. And to Stanley's point, it is quite extraordinary, uh, not only the images, the moving images, but the photographic images of Black entrepreneurial um, success, uh, working class African Americans, but the photographs themselves and even some of the moving images of the destruction and, and almost the, 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 I don't know what the right uh, adjective is, but almost a glee in writing on the, the, the photographs, running the Negro out of Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Really? You know, like you, you, you take pride in that, and that's that's an evidence. And so that's the that's really you know significant to the film's success is finding the the record that that not simply supports what a scholar uh, says, but actually elevates what what goes on because, as the cliche goes, you know, the proof is in the picture. Mm. So let's talk about Tulsa today and how Tulsa is grappling with its history, finally dealing with its history. Ms. Alford, um, tell, us a, tell us about that, about, um, is it Mayor Bynum? Yes. Ma Mayor Bynum, talk about his, how he has been on the issue of Tulsa and the race massacre and finding out what really happened. Uh, he was basically um, a city councilor some years ago when the, the city, uh, over some over 20 some odd years ago, when the city first uh, uh, started talking about the race massacre and finding uh, the graves of those uh, who had been uh, killed during the race massacre, if you will. And uh, the, uh, I think they, they got to the, situ the point to the, where they, you know, found the, the various uh, uh, locations where uh, possible graves could be uh, and basically identified those areas. And uh, before they could start uh, the excavations, uh, the whole process was halted, if you will. And um, basically, you know, we just didn't have the opportunity to move forward to find that truth. And so he decided that, you know, if he ever became the mayor, he would basically uh, start that process again. And so he did do that. And I am appreciative of, appreciative of that, if you will, um, because we need to understand our history. When we understand our history, uh, good or bad, it makes us a better people. And when we can discuss that history with each other, uh, whether we agree with each other or not, at least the truth is there and we can move forward. And. What I want is I want our community members to, you know, understand what happened uh, during the race massacre, but uh, to find, you know, it within ourselves to deal with the inequities that exist then and that exist now, and to let's just be honest with each other and to try to move forward in a peaceful and uh, justifying way, if you will. Uh, Mr. Williams, in terms of, of making the film, um, what kind of cooperation, if if any, did you get from either official Tulsa, the mayor's office, city government, but maybe even um, private white citizens in Tulsa, talking to them? Um, if you if you did, and if you did, how receptive were they to talking about? something that it seems like nobody wanted to talk about. 
Yes, uh, so Mayor Bynum was approached and the biggest challenge of making this film that is unspoken, but uh, has been the challenge of all of our lives for the past year plus was that it was filmed in November uh, in Tulsa, uh, early December, and which was certainly at the height of the, the, the COVID um, pandemic. Mm. And Mayor Bynum, although he agreed, he then uh, uh, demurred and, 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 and chose not to participate. We did speak with uh, the, the chief of police. So there were some other officials that were uh, sought. And I'm glad you asked about uh, white Tulsans. And I, and, and I think that it's, I will state this uh, emphatically and explicitly, the decision was made not to have the story be about white Tulsans and their perception, their denial, their feeling but really for this to be the story told by African-Americans about our experience. So that was a conscious choice and, and no white people other than the scholars and the mayor who you see who's in a press conference were, were uh, uh, investigated or invited to participate. That was a conscious choice. And I mean, hey, I get, I, I get that, which that leads me to ask Mr. Nelson, what kind of reaction are you anticipating or hoping for from not just white people, white Americans, but from white Tulsans having their history played back to them? Well, I, I first should say I'm going to Tulsa on the 30th, so I'll, I'll be there to see the reaction myself. I, I, I think that you know, I, I mean, I think that that it's history. I, I don't. I, I look. Nobody is is alive that that participated in in the massacre. We're not accusing anybody that's alive in the in the massacre. I think that, um, as stated, you know, we need to look at our history, and 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 it can only be helpful. Um, so I, I I I'm not anticipating um, you know any kind of adverse reaction. Uh, it's something that's happened. It's something that's documented. It's not like you can see the film and, and be like, oh, I, well, I was going to say you could see, you're not going to see the film and say, oh, oh, it didn't happen. But, um, you know, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, this country it, it has, a, has an amazing capacity not to believe what's in front of their eyes. But um, all you can do, <laughs> all you can do is put, is put it in front of their eyes and, 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 and look at it. So I, I, I myself, you know, maybe it, it's, I'm a bit, a bit naive, but I think it's going to be a, a good thing for for uh, for Tulsans to, to, to see um, uh, the story of what happened uh, and and what really happened. Ms. Alford, what do you think the reaction of of white Tulsans will be when they see the film? I think it'll be. Uh, I think we'll have various reactions, uh, if you will. Uh, I'll think that there will be those who want to uh, know the truth and there are those who don't want to know the truth. But I think that uh, the, there are probably more that, you know, are actually uh, interested in the story and uh, want to hear the story. And I think that as long as we can discuss and have those conversations and understand each other's perspectives, whether we agree with them or not, as I've said, it brings us closer to an understanding of each other, if you will, as a people. I want to close out by getting each of you to reflect on a, a sort of a three word mantra. And I can't remember the, the, the name. I think it was the, the, uh, the minister um, who was in the film, um, I believe is a minister. And he kept talking about respect, restitution and repair. So Mr. Williams, you go first. Those three words, respect, restitution and repair. What does that look like for Tulsa for you? Uh, so qualification, that is a attorney, DeMario ah, yes. Simmons, who says that and those are the closing words to the film. Um, respect, restitution and repair. I, I, for me, it means the following. Certainly a respect for the lives of the people who were killed, respect for their descendants, a respect for the stories that they have told for the last hundred years. Uh, repair 
is about, in some ways, acknowledgement of this history, to not deny it, but to be forthwith and say, yes, it did happen. I may not have been told about it as a child, but it is in the history book. I see the evidence. And restitution ultimately is that there are, uh, it is estimated that in 1921, more than $2 million worth of black wealth was destroyed and never recovered. So there is a requisite of some monetary restitution. And I believe that that is still due. That is a bill that has not been paid. Mr. Nelson? Um, I think Mark Marco's pretty much said, said it all. I mean, I, I think the only thing, thing that I could say is, you know, that, that we back up and look at that respect, restitution, and repair in, 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 in kind of its purest form. I mean, that's what, that's what we need to do as a country. You know, that's, that's where we need to go as a country. And Ms. Alford, of course, the last word to you, respect, restitution, and repair. As a descendant of survivors of the Tulsa race massacre, as someone who still lives in the community, what do those three words mean to you? I want our history, our history to be respected. I don't want it swept under the rug anymore. I want for our community members, especially our young children, to be able to understand what happened uh, to uh, our community members and to be able for the community to discuss this and respect each other. Repair, uh, we have a lot of inequities that still remain in the city, if you will, uh, and throughout the United States. And uh, repair would mean that, that uh, we still have the same, op we, we have the opportunities that everyone else has. Uh, that we don't have to wait to have a store built in North Tulsa after many years, uh, that we have the same opportunities in North Tulsa that we have throughout the other uh, uh, spaces in our city, if you will. And also restitution. Uh, restitution was due 100 years ago and restitution is still due now, in my opinion. My grandfather left this earth a broken man because he had the opportunity to provide for his family and his uh, community members and lost it within hours. And I can't tell you, I mean, it's, it's just, when you take away a man's dignity, you take everything. So with all that said, uh, if we can bring some sense of justice and solace to our community during these events and in telling our stories, then I think that we have done a great thing. Brenda Nails Alford, Marco Williams, Stanley Nelson, um, a phenomenal film, a phenomenal documentary that shines a light on an incredible moment in American history, incredible, sad moment in African American history. The History Channel's Tulsa Burning, the 1921 race massacre, conversation with directors Stanley Nelson and Marco Williams and Tulsa descendant Brenda Nails Alford. Thank you all very much for coming to 92nd Street Y. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.